you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. She does that so well. When the Iron Lady sings it, it makes it official. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. As always, thank you for uh, always being with the Chris Voss Show. For 15 years, we've been you've been putting up with our noise and nonsense and subscribing to the show. We just recently pulled our numbers four years ago when we changed the format of the show. Or we opened the format of the show to a scope of uh, all the CEOs, billionaires, multi-book authors, Pulitzer Prize winners, uh, White House advisors, you know, just the open up the scope from just normal sort of silicon. Silicon Valley stuff. We've increased the audience base on the show 1,405% in four years. Not 100%, not 200%, 1,405%. So thank you all for being a part of the show. Refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Go to goodreads.com, forward chest Chris Foss, linkedin.com, forward chest Chris Foss. Subscribe to the big LinkedIn newsletter, the big 130,000 LinkedIn group over there, and all the crazy places we are on the interwebs. Today, we're going to be talking about an amazing gentleman and some investors that are doing some really cool things. They have their own real reality TV show that they're running as well. So we'll get into it. We're going to be talking today with Frank Rizzo. He is the co-founder of Stone Capital Investors. He's got over 20 years in real estate as a broker, owner, and syndicator. And for the past 12 years, he's been active in the MHP space. We'll find that as mobile home space. And during that time, he's acquired and repositioned over 20 communities, and 1,567 lots. Starting his entrepreneurial journey in high school, he obtained his real estate license at 19, wow, and went on to earn his Series 7, 24, 63 licenses by 23. He later opened his real estate brokerage, Cornerstone Realty, at age 28, with a focus on alternative investment opportunities in the real estate market. He trained an industry-recognized uh, Frank trained industry-recognized top-producing sales agents and developed a track record for sourcing, repositioning, and marketing real estate assets. He's been elected to serve as local real estate board as director and later served as president of the Staten Island Board of Realtors. Welcome to the show, Frank. How are you? Chris, thank you very much for that introduction. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to have you as well. Thanks for coming by. And it's going to be interesting to hear your stories. And uh, maybe we'll have some uh, people that will be like, hey, I want to make some investments in this business. So, Frank, give us your dot coms. Where do you want people to find you on the interwebs? So, you can check us out at the mhpexchange.com. That is a new platform that we've put out for anybody interested in the mobile home park space. If they're interested in finding opportunity, news, education, or entertainment, the mhpexchange.com. Or you could find us at stonecapinv.com. Either one, you'll be able to find out and reach out to me. There you go. So a lot of things have been happening in the in the marketplace with homes. Home affordability is a big deal, especially for Gen Z. You know, we were talking about this before the show. I think a lot of people know the stories. You know, there's a, there's a shortage of homes in America and a shortage of, of affordability homes for new families to be able to get into homes. And and uh, so what, what? where are you guys at? Give us like a 30,000 overview of what you guys do and or what you're trying to do in, in helping the market. So, so Chris, right now we have a huge affordability issue in this country. And, and that is the, the crux of what we do and why we're in this space. We focus in the manufactured housing space, which is the most affordable of affordable housing stock, providing homes for people looking, for entry level homes for people looking to become a homeowner, get part of that American dreams in communities which they know are well-run, well-kept, safe and secure so they can grow their family and their their legacy there. So that's been our focus and our drive since we've gotten to this business about 12 years ago. And we, you know, we look forward to, you know, our motto is that when we walk in, we want to make our communities better. And we believe by us leading first, making, improving those communities on the ground, it just makes for a better experience for our consumers and better for our stakeholders all around. 
There you go. So why did you target, you know, you've been in real estate for all these different ways. Why did you personally start focusing, you know, your investment firm and uh, MHP exchange, of course, why, why did you focus on mobile homes instead of a single family residence, you know, multifamily, et cetera, et cetera? That's a great question. And growing up in Brooklyn, New York, I will tell you, there wasn't a lot of mobile home parks for me to take a good advantage of. I mean, yeah. we had zero experience from that. I had been very active in local development, especially in Staten Island on the waterfront, trying to get the downtown area you know, redeveloped. And what I found is operating in New York City, it's a lot of times it's like pushing a boulder up a hill, <laughs> right? You, there's so many different agencies that you have to deal with mm -hmm. to get anything done. I'll give you a, a perfect example. You know, we were working in the Stapleton area and there was a, train station is, and the city was going to do a multi, multi-million dollar redevelopment there. And there was a light that was busted outside the train. And, and, you know, this is an area that was a high crime area. First thing we said from our local civic association was, let's try to get the light fixed. Mm -hmm. And in speaking with the local political leaders or in that area, well, you know, you have to go talk to DOT. And if you want to clean up the train station, you have to talk to MTA. And, you know, I don't know if anybody knew this, but I have a job. Right. And my job yeah. was, you know, waiting on, you know, waiting, calling up agencies. Mm -hmm. I got exposed to this space. What we realized is that when we wanted to make improvements, we could make those improvements. You know, we, we've purchased communities that were maybe overrun with crime or overrun with, you know, situations that, that it challenged. And the improvements we wanted to make, whether it was putting in lighting or cleaning up, was met with open arms in a lot of these communities. So once we got exposed to that and realized that you could really, you know, handle community development from the ground up, we were uh, made the business fun again. And we were really hooked to be to be part of it. There you go. So I imagine this started, I guess we'll, we'll do like a chronological sort of development as you've rolled this out. I guess this started out with you forming Stone stone capital investors and creating a fund for this is that uh, do i have that right no i actually it started by um, okay. happens happenstance chris i was helping a family who was relocating out of new york mm -hmm. they had some multifamily properties and they needed to get out um mm -hmm. you know they had 100 percent occupancy 45 percent credit loss we turned their situation around and as they were relocating to north carolina they wanted me to consult with them to find something to replace the income that they were going to be missing. Oh, wow. And and the thing that ke kept popping up as being the highest yielding assets were these mobile home parks, wow. which I knew nothing about. So in making my <laughs> recommendation to them that, you know, the father who was a first generation, you know, American success story, he said that the only way he would do this is if I stayed in the deal with him and I ran the property for him. So, oh, wow. I stayed in the deal. I ran the property. We had uh, tremendous success. And then when I spoke to my partner about what had transpired, he was crazy enough to go on a barnstorming tour with me down <laughs> south. And, you know, years later, here we are, 22 communities mm -hmm. later, and, and, you know, we're still going strong. There you go. So which which came first, the, the investor funds and, and stuff for this MHP exchange? First thing was investor funds you know we mm -hmm. started out syndicating deals and for those of you who are not familiar with that was that we would f we would find an opportunity where we would group together accredited investors mm -hmm. and they would participate with us we and where we would own and operate the deal right we had a mm -hmm. business plan that we underwrote and you know we executed the you know we executed on the first park and i will tell you the first park that we did it was Kind of like pulling teeth, getting people to be involved in a park that was, you know, 800 miles away from where they were used to investing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes they probably just did it just to shut me up. <laughs> uh, however, Chris, after they saw the reliability and predictability of what we said, they didn't want to let go. And mm -hmm. that grew organically from those first seven people who who trusted us and and participated with us to you know nearly 100 people who have been on our platform and invested in some of our syndicated deals and now we just launched a fund that's focused in the mobile home park in mobile home park space mm -hmm. 
And so people can go to your website, they can find out about what it would take if they're interested in investing in mobile homes and stuff like that. Do you guys, I know uh, mobile home, there's probably different features to it, right? There's manufactured homes, there's mobile homes, there's these new tiny homes that they have that are kind of crazy. What are you guys focused on there or, or do you, is it the whole market that you're encompassing? So we haven't really got into the, you know, tiny home park model space. <laughs> I mean, we have a few. It's kind of new. We, we, we've focused primarily in the manufactured home space and, and mm -hmm. you know, mobile home, manufactured home, it's a name that gets kind of bandied about, mm -hmm. but these homes aren't very mobile. I mean, once, once they get in and they get set, yeah. on foundations and skirted and, and, and set to the ground, it takes a, quite a bit to, to move those homes. You know, mm -hmm. you need to be permitted. You need to make sure that you have a licensed mover and it becomes costly for those mm -hmm. homes to be moved. And that's one of the reasons why if you run a community well, mm -hmm. your customers or your, your, your residents tend to stay there longer than in any other asset class. Wow. You know, so, so you end up having a very, in a well-run community, you end up having a, ver a, a resident base that will stay on average 17 and a half years. Yeah. I know there's a lot of retirement mobile home communities. My my grandparents lived in one. It was really nice when I was young. Do you guys focus on a certain age group of uh, you know, like retirement communities or just do everything? Yeah, we, we, want? We, we haven't been age specific. You know, we've, mm -hmm. we've kind of kept an all age uh, community. We haven't delved into the 55 and older yet, but mm -hmm. if... You know, they do phenomenally well um, wow. because of that, you know, affordability issue because, yeah. you know, they, you know, you can get into one of these brand new homes from as low as $50,000 to, wow. you know, $180,000, where if you look at your traditional stick built home right now, a new yeah. home is on average nationwide about 550000 So there's yeah. a huge difference in the price points between traditional built and manufactured. There you go. And manufactured, I think nowadays, isn't much different than a normal home for the most part, is it? I mean, it's usually maybe two or fours and stuff. Chris, we, we have had the opportunity to visit a few plants for mm. different manufacturers that are out there. Mm. And by far and large, the, the, the advances that they've had in the industry and in the space, when you, mm. when you walk into these homes, you you're, you completely forget that you're in a manufactured home. The finishes are different. Mm -hmm. The upgrades there have have you know really taken hold, and it's a much better product than than people were used to maybe thirty or forty years ago. Yeah, I mean, I remember going to my grandparents' home when I was a kid, and they had it was a nice it was a nice mobile home. It was a nice double line, but you know you, you could still kind of catch the clunkiness of it you know you're mm -hmm. walking around feels like you're banging on aluminum and stuff it was it was an aluminum thing it was really it was really nice but you, you still kind of felt like there was a hollowness to it a, mm -hmm. to sound when you walk around but you know it was it was cozy and the park was really nice yeah. too but uh, i think yeah i think a lot of that's come a long way it, it's chris it's come a huge way uh, mm -hmm. we've seen a resurgence of interest in the space. And I think mm -hmm. some of that's been good. Some of that has been, you know, has not come without its challenges, but in doing so, I think the market has demanded a better product for the mm -hmm. end user, right? So what people used to do in a low grade manufactured home, you know, now you, certain things become standard, right? Better flooring materials. You know, you can get plot, you could get a drywall, in, on the interior of the home and that makes the construction of it so much better than it was you know when you were at your grandfather grandparents house years ago there you go so uh, now how did you develop this into the mhp exchange or did the reality show come first i noticed you guys have a big youtube channel you're running and doing their the reality show and kind of teaching people how to do things so for probably the first eight, nine years that my partner and I have been doing this. We, you know, we did everything kind of quiet, you know, or, you know, mm -hmm. organically behind the scenes. We didn't really put a lot into marketing and getting, you know, our, basically our platform out there. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we realized in the space that was a challenge was, you know, there's very little sources of information right, mm -hmm. where you can call this data and get that. So if you're interested in the space, you really have to dig deep to find out the information you wanted to find. Mm -hmm. So 
one of the things that we looked at from the MHP exchange model was it would be great if there was one platform where we can get constant news of the day. So we can hear what's happening in the MHP space, you know, whether developments are happening, whether there's rent control legislation coming down in certain areas, whether there's deals that are closing. So there would be one source where we could find that information. Mm -hmm. And also find, you know, opportunities or new listings, find out about educational aspects of it, maybe best practices that people should have and hear from industry professionals. Mm -hmm. So being that it didn't exist, mm -hmm. we created it. Um, there you go. And, and part of that was us coming out with our podcast, which is on the MHP exchange. And the reality show that you're referencing was, you know, sharing what we do, which is really turning trailer parks around into communities. And we launched a YouTube ch channel called Trailer Park Turnaround. And we just put out our first episode and, and we have our you know next one coming out shortly. And we have a lot of great content. And I think people are going to be interested, interested to see what really happens and what really you, what the work that really has to be done to turn one of these communities around. There you go. And plus, it's, it, the, the, these are fun to watch because you watch people go through, you know, they fix stuff. They, they're, you know, they, they go through whatever sort of crises they need to do in these turnarounds. People like it. You know, it's enthralling. It kind of started taking me down a, down a, down a, down the road there when I, before the show. I was, I was like going, Hey, this is kind of cool and seeing all the stuff that goes on. And, and, and I imagine it can bring, education to maybe some of the stigmas i mean there are a lot of stigmas still for mobile home parks manufacturing homes you, you, there is still a great stigma mm -hmm. regarding that and regarding that as an, an asset class and regarding that as just being involved in the space mm -hmm. i think that's starting to change because we've seen in the last three or four years uh, like a new breed of investor that's come in to the space because what they realized is something that we realized in years ago, the numbers here can be great. What one of the things that we believe that they has been missing though, is you have to have that on the ground experience and marry, you know, what looks great on paper to how do you operate efficiently and how do you maintain that community feel? Because the reason why those residents stayed so long is because they felt like they were part of a community. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we thought we think is important in any of the communities that we've purchased, we believe we've got to lead first. We uh -huh. can't go in there and say, you know, we're going to raise rents. We're going to do this without adding value to the resident first and, and improving their lives. And, I, and if you will, I'll give you a perfect example. Mm -hmm. We bought a community in, in middle Georgia. We bought it from the bank. Property was in foreclosure. Bank didn't want to be bothered with it. 89 lot community, we paid $425,000 for it. So, which you, you'd say that's a great price. Now, mm. mind you, mind you, when you get there, Chris, in the front of the park, there's a drug dealer with tattoos on half of his face. Oh, wow. On a bike selling to five, you know, there's five trap houses and one prostitute in the back of the park. So nobody wants this place, right? And, and we know that w we have 30 residents, we take it down to 13. We've got to get rid of like all the bad people because the, wow. the bad people are outside and the good people are stuck in their house, right? Yeah. So a year later, and, and we put $250,000 initially in just to clean up the roads, get rid of these people, improve the exterior of these homes. Mm -hmm. A year later, we, draw, we, we go to that community and the bad people are out and there's an ice cream truck driving down the block with a bunch wow. of children chasing it. Wow. That's the type of impact. So, yes, we did very well on that. We, you know, we ended up, you know, holding onto that park for nearly five years and selling that park for $2.6 million wow. and, and putting more money into after putting a, some more money into it and bringing in new homes and getting occupancy up to 70 units. Mm -hmm. But the impact that we had on people's lives, yeah. right? In, in changing that, in all of a sudden taking a place that was overrun with crime to, to a place that now was overrun with families who could use the playground, who could go out and chase the ice cream truck, mm -hmm. that makes it all, that's, that's the additional why, right, that you do the things that you do. 
There you go. You see that in single family resident communities where they go through gentrification, regentrification, gentrification, where they kind of get run down over 20, 30 years and then a new a new a new owners come in and you know they fix everything up and you know it becomes like yuppieville. <laughs> so and it sounds like you guys have really struck a great opportunity there where a lot of these rundown places, it's it's time for a resurgence. And I love your concept of building community because community is everything to people. And if you build community for them, they, they feel like they want to stay. And, uh, you know, we had somebody on recently who wrote about the regentrification or gentrification of uh, single family residents and homes and neighborhoods, partially on a racial sort of issues and, and in America. And one of the problems is a lot of people don't feel they have community in you know, suburban neighborhoods with single family mm-hmm. residences. And I know that with, uh, you know, like my, my grandparents' mobile home, you know, they had, it was all gated. They had really nice yards. They had probably nicer yards than my neighborhood. <laughs> I lived in houses as a kid. And then they had a community center. And so we, we you know, we were always swimming in the pool and, and uh, you know, hang, hanging out. And I think we would do luncheons and stuff there. And so it was really fun to go there. I mean, we, we really enjoyed it. It was in Hemet, California, so the sun was always out. And uh, and so, yeah, if you build community, you know, like you say, people want to people want to stay there and, and enjoy it more. And it can have more, you know, like there's no community center where I live in single family mm-hmm. residence. <laughs> I don't have a pool, damn it. What the hell what the hell am I doing here? In Vegas, the previous community I had did have a community pool for the single family residences, but you know, it's kind of vague. So But but you know, you hit the nail on the head because mm-hmm. people when people find value, right, mm-hmm. in where they're staying, they mm-hmm. want to stay and they want to they become the biggest sounding boards for new residents. So we know the community for us. The mm-hmm. community has reached that point when when our new residents are coming in from referrals of our current residents because when they live in that community, their cousin needs a place to live or their friend needs a place to live. They want them to live in the same community that they live in because they're finding value and they're finding a sense of purpose of being there. And and for us, that's a key component of what's you know, it's it's what's going to make you or, or make a differentiation from you as the operator from somebody else. And, and mm-hmm. we drive that home and we make sure our team knows that, that we want to create that sense of community and get that engagement from our residents. There you go. There you go. So now with the uh, with the MHP exchange on the website there, tell us about some of the things that are doing there. I see <laughs> listings. I see educational stuff. I see news. Tell us what the the big vision is for that. So one of the things that we have there, Chris, and I'm glad you mentioned it, and we're really proud of this because we are the first and the only MHP-specific AI agent out there. It's it's essentially your own personal assistant for information in the MHP arena. So Mm -hmm. we've trained it on the latest learning models, right? So if you have a question regarding mobile home parks, mobile home park investing, you can go there and get that information. We have a database of every mobile home park in the country. So there's over 40,000 mobile home parks that you can search, right? So if you sign up, you could search it. And we've added Street View from from Google's because when I would search for a park, one of the first things I would look at is I want to get the Street View. I want to see what what it looks like. I want to see what the, the community looks like. I want to see what the surrounding area looks like. Mm-hmm. So we've added street view with, we call it chat MHP, which is the only industry specific or mobile home park industry specific AI designed to answer your questions and to be your own personal assistant while you're trying to find your next mobile home park investment. Wow. There you go. So they can either do that on their own or they can work with you if they're accredited. You don't, you only take accredited investors, right? In the fund. That, that, that's correct. There you that's go. That's correct. And then it, is there, is there, I don't know if there's a standard for credit. Is there a standard minimum value for credit or does it vary? Company? So there, there are minimums requirements. So it's a mm-hmm. million dollars liquid net worth okay. absent of your, you know, personal residence. It is an annual income of over $250,000 a year for the past two years. If you're married, it's going to be more than that. Yeah. So there's there's a requirement that to make you an accredited investor that you have to uh, that you have to make sure that you follow through on. 
There you go. And then they can invest with you if they don't want to deal with all the hassle of, of owning one and running one. Or uh, they can use your MHP exchange to do their own work. And you guys have all the resources there, lots of education for buyers, for sellers, for owners, market trends that are going on. So you got articles that I can educate, listings, different media that you guys are doing. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, yeah, hey, I could shop for me a mobile home right here. The, uh, you even have, uh, looks like this. some of these are RV parks. for. Well, well RV, Chris, RV has become a very big component, and it's kind of mm -hmm. gone hand in hand with the manufactured housing space. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, there's a lot of hybrid you know, mobile home and RV parks mm -hmm. that we see across the country. When we first got involved in the space, we kind of shied away from it because we felt it was like a different core competency. Mm -hmm. uh, we started to get into that space. And listen, one thing that we've found in the last 12 years, Americans like to RV. During the Great Recession, people yeah. bought RVs and they went RVing because it was a more cost-effective way to, to vacation. During COVID, people bought RVs because they didn't want to be on planes and they didn't want to be in hotels. And now you have over 10 million people who own RVs in this country, and that's a big market. Mm -hmm. and, and going back to affordability, you have people who've realized it is more cost-effective for me to live in an RV, a beautiful RV, and now I get to travel the country yeah. in my own truly mobile home and get to experience life in different spots. So we do have information that's, that's out there in RV. We do want to touch on that subject as well because we think that that's a very viable option for people looking in the manufactured housing space. Yeah, there's a whole mess of these people that they're, they're uh, what do you call them? They, they love to tour the country and videotape and they have like YouTube channels and stuff and they, they do the vagabond life. And uh, vagabond, I don't know. That's a good word, we're not. But they, 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 they're enjoying their life and they're seeing the sights. And a lot of young people are doing it. You know, they get like these vans and convert them and stuff or RVs, and and they just tour about. And because of you know the ability to work remote and work off the internet, sell things off the internet, you know, they can they can kind of do it, travel, see the world, see the sights. You know, why be locked in an office for all sake? <laughs> and, and and quite frankly, not every vacation has to be Vegas or New York, right? Yeah. But well, sometimes it's nice to see the rest of the country and what the rest of the country has to offer and unplug a little bit. Right? Yeah. You know, I, I live in Vegas. That, that yeah. hurts a little bit. No, <laughs> well, I live in New York and I'm just <laughs> I need that. I need to, my roads paid for. Damn it! So uh, Vegas is a very important place to stay. Is all I'm saying, people. I need your free taxes that you afford me. But uh, no, I mean, you know, I, I, I. One of the things we thought about right before COVID, you know, I was, I was doing a lot of traveling and shows and events before COVID. And at one point, I was looking to buy one of those Mercedes uh, cruisers. Yeah, Sprinters, because my dogs, you know, it's it costs a fortune to put them in doggy daycare and board them for a week while I travel and they're not with me and it really sucks and then I got to pay for hotels and uh, I'm like you know if I could take me a travel van or RV sort of thing with it, and I could take them and they could stay in like a doggy daycare during the day and I could do my events I could have my studio I could have the podcast on a yeah. mobile thing and then I could you know I could sleep they can sleep with me and hang out. You know, I, I'm just to sleep with my dogs. If I don't have my dogs when I travel, I, I don't sleep well. It's kind of funny. And, uh, and then, you know, I could, I could have the production studios and I could, I could take my time going to events. So I wouldn't have to race to them. So yeah, there's a whole beauty to it. Anyway, what have we covered for all the different things that you're doing that we want to touch out, tease on or plug? I think you touched on everything, Chris, which is, yeah. and I appreciate that the MHP exchange if you're interested in the mobile home park space, mm -hmm. uh, that is a spot where if you, like I said, you could go there, you could try chat MHP, you can, you could sit there, get a lot of that information that you might be interested in that space. And it has that ticker to give you the updated information from news from across the country to get updated on that. And then you can always, obviously you'll, you'll stay in tune to any podcast or, you know, you'll be able to see the next episode of trailer park turnaround, which uh, you know, I appreciate the fact that you watched it and what was something we're really proud of to give people a real on the ground look of what it takes to turn one of these communities around. There you go. And uh, the affordability, I mean, Gen Z, they're really struggling to buy homes and find affordability. It doesn't look like anything's going to change anytime soon with that. And, and they're downsizing their family size too. You know, a lot of them aren't getting married and having kids till later, if at all. And 
you know, my problem I've always had all my life being single and, you know, I can't afford the divorces and no kids. And I, I just never really got tired of being happy uh, <laughs> and just trying to find stuff to do with my money. It's really, mm -hmm. it's a hard life when you don't have kids. Yeah. People don't realize it. And uh, I don't have a wife who's down at Target every, you know, twice a day. And so if you do, well, then good for you. But uh, I can't afford that. I mean, I make way too much money to afford that. And so for me, I've always needed, like, I've always kind of wished for a tiny home because mm -hmm. I never really, because I'll get in home uh, and, and I'll, you know, I'm like, what do I need four bedrooms for, for me and two dogs? And so it's, it's always been just crazy. And, mm -hmm. and since they're Siberians, you know, I need a yard, mm -hmm. but uh, for me, I mean, mobile homes or, or manufactured homes or tiny homes are probably just the way I'm going because I don't, it's the older I get, the more curmudgeon I get. So I don't think there's any. I don't think there's any hope for me at this point. So only giant homes and giant neighborhoods just <laughs> don't really even work for my <laughs> lifestyle. And I, I think a lot of the Gen Zers, the the future Gen Alphas, you know, I, I think they're going to be dealing with the same sort of issues I've dealt with all my life. Where like, what do you need a giant home for? Like seriously. Plus, it's sometimes a money pit for all the stuff you have to do with a giant home. Well, well, what this does in, in the manufactured housing does it gets them. I still believe that owning is the pathway to financial freedom right yeah. so the, the reason why you do this is you, you you want to start that pathway through it and if you buy if it's a manufactured home or a small home, the, the idea is at some point you at least you're building equity right if you're paying yeah. rent you're never seeing that money again yeah. right you, that, that money is you're, you're always paying somebody's mortgage right it's either yours or your landlord's right mm -hmm. one way or the other so what we do in our communities is we want to sell the home to the resident, right? So they own the home. Mm -hmm. We don't want to own the home. There's third parties who could do financing. There's different ways that they could become a homeowner. But at the end of the day, if they want to leave, there's some value there. There's mm -hmm. some get back there, right? They can get some money to, you know, to take their next stage of life because at the end of the day, you still want to own a home because it is the number one way to create wealth and pass wealth on to your next generation. So mm -hmm. if you're starting a family, you, you it might not be your be all end all, right? And, and I've seen this from working in real estate and dealing with buyers for the past 20 plus years. You have people who, who you know, they there's an instant gratification. I want what my parents have. Well, your parents took that step, right? They they bought maybe one or two ho homes along the way that you didn't you weren't involved with or you didn't see, and that's what helped them build that equity. So yeah, you, they, they've you've got to start somewhere. Manufactured home is a great place to start to at least get you on that pathway to home ownership. And 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 eventually, if you want to turn over, just turn over as a rental. You know, there's. I mean, that's, I remember when I got my first big house, I bought this uh, nice place up in the canyon. And I remember looking at it going, Jesus, I should have bought five starter homes and lived in one and <laughs> ran out the four others for the price I just paid for this. What an idiot I am. And it was just like me. Well, I moved two girlfriends in over time, but not at the same time, folks. Calm yeah, down. But you could have moved them into two of the starter homes. Yeah. And then it would have been easier to evict them. <laughs> so there you go. One was a little harder than the other. The other one left voluntarily, but uh, the other one almost had to be evicted. But uh, yeah, I mean, that I, must I, be an interesting story. Yeah, <laughs> it was. It was uh, one of the things you learn. That's why, that's why I live alone now. But uh, and with two big dogs and two big dogs <laughs> and and they never need to be evicted because they're such good tenants for the most part, even though they're Siberians. But you know, I, I looked at it and I'm like, geez, I could have bought for the price of this home, I could have bought five starter homes, you know, just basic, you know, starter startup homes, and I could have rent out four of them, mm -hmm. and I would have had my rent paid on my you know my main home and my rent paid on the other homes, and I, I was like, what did I just do? Like I'm an idiot. And so I think, I think this might be a target thing. Like I'm sitting here doing the calculations in my brain going, I should probably go buy a couple mobile homes, <laughs> manufacturing homes and, and rent them out and then go live in one. Cause I need, you know, a yard and then, you know, everything's paid for. And then I can kind of keep an eye on my neighbors too. Cause they'll be right across from me or something that can be like, what's going on over there. Not, not a bad, not a bad idea, Chris, not a bad idea. Uh, maybe some investments thing. Cause those Gen Z years, man, I know what they're up to, man. They're not, they're not, they're not, I don't think they're, I mean, marriage isn't like a big thing anymore for them. 
having kids, they're starting families later. I mean, it's going to be an interesting economic model that we're running into. So maybe uh, maybe there's some opportunities there. Yeah. There you I, go. I think that there would be some opportunities with that. There you go. I don't know that I want to put it with Gen Z years for renters, but I don't know. Renters are renters, right? So uh, final thoughts, uh, Frank, tell everyone uh, whatever we want to pitch out, plug, how they can reach out to you, how they can learn more about you, work with you, et cetera, et cetera. If, if they want to reach out, they want to learn more, you could go to the MHP exchange.com, you know, subscribe and you get in there. You'll be part of our newsletter. We'll keep you up to date as to updated as to what is going on. You'll get information on all our, you know, next podcast drop or which is information piece or our next reality show drop. And additionally, you'll, you'll also get information on the space. So go to the MHP exchange.com. Alternatively, if you, you could reach us at stonecapinv.com as well. There you go. I love it too that you guys are doing your own show for the reality show. I think more companies that I think this might become a trend. We were talking about before the show, we had San Pedro fish market folks on, and they're like a 7,500 year old family fish market with multiple locations in Long Beach. What am I doing an ad here with multiple locations? And uh, they, they started their own reality show because they want to control their brand and their narrative. And uh, I don't know, maybe the Chris Foss show will start its own reality show. You can, there'll be a reality podcast for the behind the scenes of the Chris Foss show. No one wants to see that. Anyway, thank you very much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for having me, Chris. Really there you go. And thanks for honest for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Chris Foss, one of the TikTok, and all this crazy place we're on the internet. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye.